years ago, everyone knew the title given to a man who built barrels, buckets, and tubs. Today, however, the question, what's a barrel maker called, is common at historic sites where staff are trying to keep the trade of coopering alive. The answer, a barrel maker is called a cooper. According to Kenneth Kilby, author of the book The Cooper and His Trade, the origin of the word cooper is said to stem from the winemakers of Illyria and Cisalpine Gaul, where the wine was stored in wooden vessels called cupels, and the maker of these vessels was called a cuparius. The Middle Low German word kufer or cooper was derived from this, and similarly the English word cooper. The trade of coopering is a mysterious and complicated craft that dates back to the days of the pharaohs. It's on the walls of the pyramids where we find carvings of some of the earliest coopered tubs. From 2690 BC to the present, barrels and tubs have been used for a variety of jobs, mainly for the storage and shipment of foods and goods, in the process of making wines and spirits, and as measures in trade and commerce. Because barrels aren't used as much for storage or shipment of goods these days, there aren't very many practicing hand coopers around. And while barrels are still used in the process of making wine and liquor, these are now made by machine. The use of machines since the early 1900s, the invention of refrigeration, and speedier modes of transportation have all helped to reduce the number of jobs for hand coopers. Today's cooper is a person who completes four or five years of training and operates the machines that make barrels. Years ago, a cooper was a man who had completed a lengthy apprenticeship of seven years and could build a barrel a day by hand. The trade is slowly dying. There are places like the Whitchurch Stovall Museum where you can still find a cooper at work. Dan Zorowski is a volunteer at the museum who practices the traditional trade of coopering. He works in a barn with old-fashioned tools and builds small kegs, buckets, and tubs. Working with Dan today is Brian Ritchie. Both Brian and Dan learned the trade of coopering in Old Fort William in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Watch closely as a pile of oak becomes a nine-gallon keg known as a firkin. Coopers select only the straightest trees for use in making barrels and they are cut down in the winter when their sap is down. Later on the trees are cut in billets. The height of the keg or cast to be built determines the length of each billet. These billets are eventually split into stave stock using two tools, a fro and a maul. Notice how the fro is lined up on the billet to ensure the proper thickness. The wooden maul is used to strike the fro so as to not damage it. A uniform grain adds to the strength of the keg, and the cooper also tries to slice off pieces of wood so that the grain runs at the right angle to its width. Because the splitting of staves is a long and tiring job, it's best to do it in the fall. Like the old saying goes, wood will heat you twice, once when you split it and once when you burn it. For coopers, add a third time, once more when you build a barrel. The wood should dry for about a year before it's used for building a barrel so that it will not shrink any further when it is used. If there is a small leak, however, the container will swell and seal it off. Every container made has a specific volume and name. A barrel is a 36-gallon cask, and a firkin, the one we are making here, is a 9-gallon keg. Regardless of the barrel size, however, the cooper can always depend on the fact that the volume of his work will always stay the same. Once the wood is properly seasoned, the cooper begins his task at the block. With his broad axe, he roughly shapes the piece of wood into a stave. The piece is given a straight back, a hollow, angles, and a taper. The axe is a quick tool to use, as you can see from the size of the chips that are chopped off. The more work done with the axe, the more time the cooper saves in the later stages of construction. To refine the shape of each stave, the cooper works at his shave horse with two draw knives. The shave horse allows the cooper to hold the stave with his feet and use his hands to work the tool. Coopers refer to this stage as dressing the staves. 
First, a backing knife is used to put the outside curve on the stave. Next, a hollowing knife is used to put the inside curve on the stave. By thinning out the inside, the stave becomes easier to bend. After the set of staves has been dressed, they are jointed. Jointing is the most important part in the shaping process of each stave. If the jointing and tapering of the stave is done correctly, the firkin will be tight and look proper. If the jointing is poor, then the firkin will surely leak and look lopsided. Basically, the cooper carefully holds each stave at an angle and runs them over the blade of the jointer. He will plane each one so that it will be wider in the middle and of a smooth angle of join. The taper will determine the amount of belly or bulge the firkin will have. The bulge of a barrel gives three unique advantages to kegs and casks that straight-sided boxes don't have. The barrel shape gives coopered containers extra strong sides because of the double curve. And the hoops on a barrel can be tightened easily by driving them down onto the bulge of the container. This helps to keep the keg from leaking. And the bulge also allows the barrel to be rolled very easily because very little of the container touches the ground. Cooper's joint staves by carefully checking each cut by eye. It's possible to make a template to help check each joint, but the taper cannot be checked with the template because the width of each stave determines the amount of its own taper. Thus a cooper must carefully sight down each stave to ensure that there is a proper amount. You can imagine that one slip on the joiner can result in a serious injury. Most coopers can tell at least one story of that one stave that flipped over, and they can verify the story by showing you the scar. For more control, the cooper pushes the staves over the plane. With a simple turn of his wrist, he can create the exact angle he wants on the stave and quickly check it. If the stave were held in a vise and planed, it would be very time consuming to keep checking its angle. When all the staves are dressed and jointed, it's time to raise up the keg. Dan uses a clamp to hold one stave in place. He holds the others back against the clamp stave as he fills the hoop. It's best to alternate wide and narrow staves. This makes the bending easier because wide staves are more difficult to bend compared to narrow staves. This also helps to keep the barrel or keg strong all around. Once the hoop has been filled, some staves may be changed or their place in the keg exchanged for another stave. Then other hoops are driven on. Once tight, the cooper can examine the joints. If there is a crack or an improperly jointed stave, it must be repaired at this stage. The overall shape of the keg is also looked at. It's important that it does not lean. When all is set, the cooper prepares to fire the keg. The necessary tools are gathered, work hoops and chips are all brought outside. A fire is set inside a small cresset and the raised keg is put over the top of the fire to heat. Coopers use a dry heat process to bend their containers. Water could be used to bend wood but this would mean that the volume or measure of the container could not be completed until the staves were dried out. Since time is a factor, by using heat the keg or cask can be bent and completed that day because the staves will no longer expand or shrink. Remember, they've already dried for a year. The chippings that were made earlier at the block are used to keep the fire going. When the firkin is hot to the touch on the outside, the coopers use a windlass to begin the process of drawing in the bottom of the keg. This process may take up to 40 minutes. If rushed, the staves may crack or break. The mysterious nature of this process has often had people puzzled. It is not the heated sap that allows the wood to be reshaped. Remember, the wood is very dry. In fact, it is the heated lignin that is allowing the bending to occur. Lignin is a substance that binds the wood fiber together. When warmed, the wood can be reshaped. When cool, it will help the staves retain their curve shape.
Once the first hoops have been fitted, the windlass is taken off. Now the two coopers team up to truss in unison. By each striking his hoop drift at the same time, the hoop is forced down in a level fashion. Once the last hoop is driven on tightly, the coopers flip the firkin over to ensure that all hoops are tight. During all of this hammering, the fire is burning. If by chance the keg catches on fire, the nearby bucket of water and a rag are used to extinguish the flames. When all the hoops are in place, the keg is given a last heating to allow the staves to set into their new position. The hoops on the container now are the work hoops, or sizing hoops. They will come off and new ones will be put on once the ends are completed. Once cooled, the keg is taken inside to be completed. First the ends are sawn off to create level surfaces for the keg to stand on. It's at this time that the cooper first sees how tight the end of his container will be. A crumb knife is used to round and smooth the inside part of the firkin at its ends. This is in preparation for a groove in which the top of the firkin will sit. The ends are trued using a sun plane. The sun plane is curved because it rides along a curved surface. It's very important that the ends of the keg are level because the crows, the tool that cuts the groove, will ride on this edge. If it is not level, the crows will not cut properly. The crow's cutter is a simple tool that has teeth to cut the narrow groove where the keg ends or heads will be fitted. Since this firkin is made out of white oak, much effort has to be applied in order to cut into the wood. A firkin made out of white pine or cedar would be much easier to build. It is usually impossible to find one board wide enough to use as the head of a firkin. Here three pieces of oak have been planed, jointed and attached together with dowels. In between each piece is a strip of what coopers call flag. This is really dried bulrush that when split in half will prevent leakage from the head. If a barrel is going to leak, it will leak from the head. To measure the size of the head is tricky business. The head must fit exactly into the crows or else there will be a leak. The technique you are about to see would have been a closely guarded secret of the trade decades ago. As you will see, the principles of sizing a head are basic geometry. Using a set of dividers or a compass, the cooper estimates the radius of the circle. He puts one point into the crows because he wants to ensure that the head fits in the back of the crows. Then remembering where he started, Dan walks the dividers around the inside of the crows. On the sixth turn, if the dividers return to the starting point, the true radius of the circle has been found. In mathematical terms, a chord of an arc, one-sixth of the circumference of a circle, is equal to the radius of that circle. To make sure the head has been sized correctly, Dan will check the measurements from different starting points in the crows. With the headstock prepared and dowelled together as one, dividers are used to scribe the circle that will become the head, and a turning saw is used to cut it out. Past experience has taught Dan to cut to the outside of the mark line. He can always trim the head smaller, but if it's too small, he'll have to start all over again. Bevels are cut on both sides of the head so that it will wedge into the crows tightly. A draw knife is used to do this trimming. The hoops are then loosened on the firkin and the head placed in. The hoops are then tightened and the joints are checked. Everything should be tight. If a crack appears, then the head is too large and will need trimming. The second head is completed in the same way as the first. Putting in the second head is a tricky job that requires patience and a special touch. Naturally, if the inside of the container requires planing, it is done before the heading of the keg. Some kegs require a smooth inside because of their intended use. With both heads in place, all that's left to do is clean up the outside of the keg with a spoke shave. The work hoops are taken off one at a time and replaced with brand new iron hoops. A 
Cooper makes his own hoops out of soft iron, and there's no need to forge because cold rivets can be smashed with a heavy hammer. Iron hoops are put on oak containers for a tight seal. Wooden hoops were usually found on dry goods containers where small cracks between staves weren't a concern. In the early days of coopering, wooden hoops were used on all containers. Liquid kegs required more wooden hoops though, 10 or 12 in order to achieve water tightness. When the final hoop is driven on, the oak firkin should ring like a bell. The bung hole and the tap hole aren't drilled until a customer purchases the keg. This way the inside remains clean. At the end of the day stands a white oak firkin in the Witchard Stovall Cooperage. It has been completely made by hand of wood that has been air dried for over a year. It will be able to hold a liquid or keep dry goods dry. If cared for, it could be in service for over 50 years. The guarantee is found on the chime of the barrel, the Cooper's Mark.